Yes, well, what has been suggested is that we might have a different scenario here, that uh, Jesus leaves off of the discussion of the A.D. 70 judgment at verse 15, and then, uh, correct me, Brian, if I got this wrong, at verse 36, goes back to the original question of the disciples, having to do with um, when he will come and... Um, and the signs of, uh, let me see. All right, so 15 to 35 on your explanation would be the parentheses, yeah. and that deals with AD 70. Yeah. All right, so that I'm just seeing logically the relationship to my interpretation. Then you would say that verses 4 through 14 have to do with the final coming of Jesus. Yeah, they're answering specifically the question, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And well, I see two problems immediately with that interpretation. The first one is this, that in verse 34, Jesus is categorical about all these things being fulfilled within that generation. He doesn't say, now I'm, I'm resuming a different topic or about some of these things, I'll go on talking. He says, everything that I've been talking about up to this point is fulfilled within this generation. There is no justification for making the break or creating the parentheses, to use your language, especially when Jesus uh, uh, encapsulates all of it as a this generation uh, discussion and discourse. And by the way... We would have to go back from 34 all the way into what we call chapter 23, remember, where Jesus has already said, these things shall come upon this generation. So I would argue from this generation in chapter 23 to this generation in chapter 24, Jesus has the same things in mind. And then secondly, if you look at the question of the disciples, and this, this may be like why you begin there, because as you say, you wish Jesus you know, at least for your sake, would make it a little clearer. The disciples had the same problem, I think. Verse 3, as he sits on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? They seem to think that the coming of Jesus and the end of the world are going to be the same. And the purpose of Jesus, well, it's not the one and only, but a purpose of Jesus' discourse is to instruct his disciples that they should not bring these two things together. That he is going to come, this is the judgment on Jerusalem in this generation, but the end of the world will be yet later. So he gets to a place where he brackets his discourse and says everything up to this point takes place in this generation. Again, verse 34 Truly, I say to you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be accomplished. Verse 36, but of that day and hour, of the end of the world, no one knows, even the angels of heaven, the Son, or the, the Father only. And he goes on to say, of the end of the world, there will be no signs whatsoever, not even the signs, Brian, that are mentioned in uh, verses 4 to 14 on your interpretation those signs will not appear before the end of the world either. Because in that day, there will be no precursor indications. And so I suppose that the diff that's the difficulty I have with your interpretation. But maybe Jesus is trying to help those of us who come to the text thinking his coming and the end of the world must be together. He says, I have a coming that will not be the end of the world. I'm going to come and destroy the Jews for their rebellion. In Mark's Gospel, when Jesus gives his discourse on divorce, you don't get all the qualifications. You just get the quick summary. Jesus tells us that if a person's divorced then marries another, he or she commits adultery. It's only in Matthew's Gospel that we get the full description where Jesus says, except for fornication, if a man divorces, he commits adultery and so forth. And so again, what, what we have here is when we start using the doublets or the parallel passages between the Gospels, we really must know something about the literary style of the authors. And uh, so when you bring this up, uh, I mean, if you're committed to this point of view ahead of time, I might not be able to shake you from it with this. But when you bring it up to me, I'm say, as I said, tongue-in-cheek, well, that's typical. 
Mark doesn't give all the details. This is a very quick summary presentation. But Matthew shows us that they really had more concerns than just that. So he lays it out further. But now let's say, up to this point, my answer to Brian, that I'm wrong about the disciples making this confusing um, uh, compacting of the coming with the end of the world. And then in fact, Jesus was talking only about A.D. 70 in his coming and the end of the world, meaning the end of the age where the Jews are God's special people. I'm sympathetic to that because I've interpreted other verses in that way. If, if I'm wrong on that, I would still maintain that what you have is Jesus explains the end of the age and the end of the Jewish order um, and explains his coming in judgment up to the 34th verse when he brackets it by saying all these things in this generation. And then what Jesus does is he goes beyond the disciples' question and he says, but there's another kind of coming that I want to tell you about. And that's going to be a coming that's not just on Judea, but the whole world, not with signs. It'll be a surprise. And then it's interesting, at the end of what we call chapter 24, in the 25th chapter, Jesus goes on, what do we have? Further instruction about the coming at the end in the final judgment when the sheep and the goats will be separated. And so, again, if you look at chapter 23... Forget the chapter breaks, but if you begin what we call chapter 23, it runs down to 2434. And then if you look at what Jesus turns to in the short section at the end of chapter 24, it's not really short because he continues it out into chapters 25 and 6 to talk more about the second coming. And that all the more strengthens this cleavage that you have right there where Jesus puts it. This generation, but now that day. What I'm suggesting is that the end of the age used in the disciples' question really means the end of the world, the whole, you know, the whole game, if you will. It's finally over. However, it may not be used that way at all times. And within the discourse, Jesus says, you know, then the end comes and so forth. He means the end of the Jewish nation at that point. So, on my interpretation, he's separating two issues. On your interpretation which you don't have to say he's doing that, uh, the end of the age would be the end of the Jewish order. But the end of the age elsewhere in Scripture pertains to the end finally, not just the end days. This I don't want to confuse you because after we take a break, we're going to come back and I'm going to give you a lecture where that's one of the points I'm going to make is that last days and end of the ages does not mean the very end of human history. So there's a great variety of uses, and you have to let the local context determine, I think. Please don't let it, I don't want anyone to have the idea that this question of the disciples and how to interpret it, whether you divide two issues, is at all crucial to my interpretation. What I've offered you today stands or falls on other grounds. This one is a side issue. Um, since Jesus says his return and final judgment will be like a thief in the night, when a post-millennialist says there are all these things that we need to look for that are going to be accomplished before Jesus returns, is it really true that he's going to come back as a thief in the night? Can we expect that he'll return right now? This is the whole issue of the imminency of his return. And uh, that, too, because of what's been drilled into our heads by uh, dispensational preachers, and sometimes all millennial preachers, too, has really misled the church. In the first place... Jesus will not come back as a thief in the night upon his people. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. Concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need that anything be written unto you. <laughs> Don't you love it when the Bible says something like that? Here we are, we're struggling with this issue in an afternoon conference. We're saying, no, write more, write more, we need... The reason Paul does that, as you'll see in my next lecture, is because he had extensively taught the Thessalonians about these matters, and he expects them to remember what he said. That's frustrating, I know. There's a reason in God's providence why he doesn't fill in that. But there's a background to Paul's teaching that's not repeated for us. He says, you don't have any need this be taught you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, when they are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall in no wise escape. 
For those who are not looking for the coming of Christ, those who are not watchful, those who are not diligent, those who are not following his instructions, it will be a big surprise. What's Paul say in the next verse? But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day, etc. Now, what this does not mean, and then what it does mean. It does not mean that Christians know when Jesus is returning. Okay, the fact that there are signs of Christ's return, the Christianization of the nations, if I have that right. Let's just take it as an example. The fact that I know that the nations will be Christianized before Jesus returns does not tell me when he's going to return. It does tell me what has to happen before he returns, though, because God doesn't break his promises. And so if God has promised to give his son the nations as his inheritance, and that before the final enemy at the resurrection is defeated, then I have every right to expect that. And so I don't know when he will return, but I know it won't be tonight. Now, I realize what I've just said, and I know that shocks many people. The fact of the matter is, I have the choice of saying God doesn't keep his promises. or Well, there's a third alternative that we can throw out and say, God doesn't keep his promises, or Jesus will not come tonight, or the whole world will be Christianized and will beat their swords into plowshares and so forth in about the next five hours. Nobody seriously maintains that because there's not that great a discontinuity in God's plan for bringing the kingdom. It's first the blade, then the ear, and then the full you know, head of wheat and so forth. So we know it's gradual. Five hours is not enough time. Jesus is not coming tonight. That's not brazen of a Christian to say. It's based on God telling me he will not do certain things. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians, so it's a different issue, Paul tells us, that we are not to be troubled, quickly shaken in mind, as though the day of the Lord is just at hand. It's not, it wasn't inappropriate for the Thessalonians to say, oh no, we know the day of the Lord is not right at hand. Other things have to happen first. Now, if one of those things that have to happen is the Christianization of the nations, it is not ungodly, it is not untoward, it's in fact just being faithful to God's word to say Jesus is not going to return without doing what he um, was promised by the Father would be done and accomplished, or accomplishing what he has said he will do in his mediatorial reign. It does not mean I know when he is coming. It means that I do know he won't come until he has done everything that he has promised to do. So how can it be that, he, that his return will not be upon me or you or faithful Christians as a thief? Because the way the Christian lives in the world is with a constant expectation of meeting his Lord. Whether it's the second coming or the day of his death, we always labor in the presence of the Lord. And so when Jesus does show up in whatever generation, those people who are laboring faithfully and looking for him will not be surprised. Does that make sense? I do, yes. The, the unbelieving world is not looking at all. Christians are always looking. So when it does show up, whenever that is, it won't be a, a surprise to them. Um, the suggestion here is that uh, there were those who could not say when the Messiah would be born, but nevertheless they were awaiting the consolation of Israel. And in a similar way, Christians cannot say when Jesus will return. They cannot pinpoint the day or the hour and so forth. But yet he won't come as a thief upon them because they'll labor in expectation of his return. By the way, and Jesus tells us that expectation is seen not in our looking up into the skies, but rather our attending to his work while he is gone. And so if we are watchful, diligent, faithful servants, it won't be a surprise whenever uh, the householder returns because we're prepared at any moment to meet him. Well, thank you for returning from the break. I would like to continue my uh, lecture at this point by turning to three other passages that uh, might easily be used by people to, uh, to prove a pessimistic eschatology that says we really can't expect all these promises of God about the knowledge of the Lord coming to the earth and all things being sanctified and all nations turning to the Lord and all enemies being defeated to really take place in history. 
Because what the Bible tells us is that we must be pessimistic about the course of history, seeing the judgment of God and the opposition of God's enemies really prevail, even though God's supposed to be sovereign, Jesus is supposed to have all power and authority in heaven on earth, nevertheless, for some reason, earth is going to be turned over to the wicked one until the final day when Jesus comes back. As you know, my own conviction is that Jesus is presently, as the resurrected Lord of the covenant, sovereign over all things, seated at the right hand of God, exercising the power of the Holy Spirit to bring the nations into his saving design and to sanctify his people so that Satan's house is being spoiled. Over against this, people might turn to the book of Revelation. Because after all, in the book of Revelation, from chapters 4 through 19, we read, and I cannot possibly, if I'm going to have an hour's lecture, read that much material to you, we read about all sorts of different judgments, with angels coming forth from the altar, and and a fire, and brimstone, and hail, and lightning, and horsemen, and all sorts of things that just look really negative and pessimistic. Judgments taking place. The people of God are being martyred. How then, Dr. Bronson, can you say that the overall course of history is going to be positive for the kingdom of God when the book of Revelation seems so negative about those things? Well, as you know, the way in which I dealt with Matthew 24 was to say that it has been, by those who are pessimist in their eschatology, grossly misinterpreted. Not because I have brought a preconceived idea to the passage, and now I've got to find some way to dance around it. The fact of the matter is, the mental gymnastics must be performed by those who think this is Jesus' discussion of the course of history. Even though he says, he's talking about that generation. Even though the things that the context and parallel passages show us uh, would indicate that he's dealing with the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. You have people who have just got their minds made up in advance. This will be uh, the second coming and the judgment of God and the great tribulation of that day. I honestly believe that a post-millennialist doesn't have to go through those hoops, doesn't have to, have to uh, go through the gymnastics of avoiding the text. And likewise, in the book of Revelation, though it is pervasively thought by people to be a book that talks about the final days of Earth's history, right before the Lord returns in glory to kind of, if you will, uh, save the bacon, the book of Revelation, just like the Olivet Discourse, predominantly, not exclusively, predominantly deals with the judgment of God in history in the ancient world. And I'm going to try to set that out before you um, in the next few minutes. The book of Revelation was written, contrary to um, a popular opinion today, though at the turn of the century you'll find scholarship was united against the opinion that it was written in the 90s. Against that popular opinion, the book of Revelation was written in the later portion of the 60s of the first century after Christ. The persecution that John is undergoing on the island of Patmos, I believe, corresponds to the persecution and martyrdom of Peter and Paul in Rome under the Emperor Nero. The internal evidence from the book of Revelation supports what I'm telling you. If you'll turn with me, please, to Revelation 11.1. 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and one said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. And the court, which is outside the temple, leave outside and don't measure it. It's been given to the nations. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months. Here we see that when John wrote the book of Revelation, the temple in Jerusalem was still standing, and so was Jerusalem as a city. However, Shortly, or at least in the future, whether it's short or long, in the future, the holy city is going to be destroyed by the Gentiles. And so Revelation 11 tells us that the book must be dated prior to the fall of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. 
But then we can get even more precise. Revelation 17.10. An angel has come to John to explain to him this beast upon which the scarlet woman is riding. Verse 9 says, Here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings. The five are fallen, the one is, the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a little while. He'll reign but just a short period. John is told that there's a double imagery here pertaining to the heads of the beast. In one sense, they're like hills. And so the woman, Babylon, sits on seven hills, which is, by the way, in all of ancient literature, the description of Rome. The city sat on seven hills. And so you have Rome here being depicted, but then John's told the heads are also the heads of the beast, and so they're kings. The beast is the Roman Empire, and so the heads of the empire would be the kings or emperors of Rome. And five have fallen. There have already been five emperors of Rome. The sixth is now reigning, and when he's taken out of the way, the next one in line isn't going to last very long at all. Now, the Jews counted the emperors of Rome from Julius Caesar. Yes, I know Roman history says he died on the Ides of March, didn't quite get his heart's desire, though he had deified himself and all the rest. The fact is he ruled as an emperor over the Roman Empire. And so in Jewish literature, in fact, we, we have indications of this, when they counted the emperors, we know they counted Julius to be first. If you count down the emperors of Rome, and you come to the sixth emperor of Rome, it's Nero. And after Nero died, probably from a self-inflicted wound, after Nero died, the claimant to the throne lasted only three months. So even as John said, we have someone that's now the head of the empire, the sixth emperor of Rome, and when he goes away, the next one's going to last but a short time. And so we know that the book of Revelation was written before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. The temple is still standing. We know even more it was written during the reign of Nero Caesar, the sixth emperor of Rome. The book of Revelation, I cannot interpret verse by verse. You know that already, but I can give you an outline of the book of Revelation and if we look at that outline and interpret a couple of key characters, then I can come back to this question of whether it really is contrary to any post-millennial hope. Turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 1. The outline for the book of Revelation is provided by John at verse 19 of the first chapter. Jesus instructs him, Therefore write the things which thou sawest, and the things which are, and the things which shall come to pass hereafter. There's three sections. The things you've already seen, the things that are presently the case, the things that will happen shortly hereafter. And now if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, After these things I saw, and behold, the door opened in heaven, and the first voice that I heard, a voice of a trumpet speaking with me, one saying, Come up hither, I will show thee the things which must come to pass hereafter. Consequently, by the time we get to what we call chapter 4, we already know that the first two of the three sections of the book have been expended. Chapter 1, the things which he's already seen. Chapters 2 and 3, the things which are presently the case in the church. And then beginning at chapter 4, verse 1, the things hereafter. And then if you read the book of Revelation from chapter 4 on through the 19th chapter, you will notice that there's an internal structuring device, a literary device that is used by John himself to divide what he has to say. G uh, John shows us, first of all, a scroll, a seven-sealed scroll that only the Lamb of God can open. And so in chapter 4 and 5, we are introduced to the scroll and to the Lamb of God who then breaks the seals of the scroll and unrolls it so that now there's a revelation of a certain portion of history. And I won't say what that portion is or get into that argument at this point. I just want you to look at the literature here. 
John has a, a scroll. He is introduced to a scroll that is opened up, and then all these events start flying off the page, as it were. And he sees these wild things taking place and all this imagery. Well, then we come to um, the end of the first half of this last section of the book. And in uh, chapter 10, John now is introduced to a, another book, this one called A Little Scroll. In fact, he's instructed by God to eat the scroll, and it's something that is sweet to the taste but bitter in his stomach. And in conjunction with John being told to take up this new scroll, he said, you must prophesy again, this time over many people's tongues and nations. So it's always helpful to let a book give you its internal structure and interpretation. Apparently, John has first prophesied over one nation, or so the contrast would su be suggested to us, that on a scroll that had seven seals on it. And then John is given another book, and this one will be a second prophecy, but this one a universal one, over many nations, so forth and so on. It turns out that the two sections of the book, or the two scrolls that John relates to us, are found, I'll give you the, the transition here, from chapter 4 through the end of chapter 12, basically you have the first scroll, although we're introduced to the second section that's coming. So chapters 4 through 12 deal with one particular prophecy of judgment. And then chapters 13 through 19 deal with another section of judgment or another kind of judgment, a second scroll. There's a great deal of literary parallelism between these two scrolls. We have seven trumpets of judgment, seven bowls of judgment. The seven in each case are divided into sections of four, two, and one. Actually, four and three, and the three then divided into two and one. Uh, we have an introductory section that tells us the main players in the prophecy in both of these segments, the seven-sealed scroll, seven scroll and the small book, and so forth. At the end of the pouring out of the declaration of the trumpeting of the judgments of God, you have almost identical declarations that the kingdom of God has been established. And so in this short period of time, which doesn't do it at all justice, Maybe I can give a commercial here and say if you'd like to get, you know, some, I don't know what it is, 60 plus tapes on the book of Revelation that I went through over a few years exposition, they're available from our tape ministry. And uh, so here I am compacting all that work into about 15 minutes. Amazing, isn't it? Did I waste time then or am I really not doing it justice now? Well, I think I'm not doing it justice, but I hope you get the overall pattern. John says, three things to be told you. What I've already seen, the state of the church right now, things to take place hereafter. In the things to take place hereafter, two scrolls. One dealing apparently with a particular nation, God's judgment, and then John is to prophesy again, now universally over all the nations. And the break point is chapter 12. Chapter 12 explains to us how the first judgment has taken place that the kingdom of God has been established. And it explains it in terms of God's judgment on Satan. So the first enemy has been judged, and then God says, and it has to do with Jesus' victory over Satan that this is taking place. Then the next section of the book, the second scroll, now over many nations, shows the judgment of God, and that ends with chapter 20, which again tells us how that victory took place because of Jesus' victory over Satan, his binding of Satan, and so forth. And at the end of the description of the millennium, which is what, of course, so many people love to debate about, John then turns to the, the return of Christ, the final judgment, the institution of the consummate form of the new heavens and the new earth, and that then ends the book. So there's the sweep of the book for you. What's it about? Well, who is the enemy of the first section? Remember the seven-sealed scroll discussed in chapters 4 through 11? 
I think we can come to the heart of the matter here if um, we look at just a few passages. The enemy of the first section is Jerusalem in John's own day. Again, look at Revelation 11. John is told to measure the temple and the altar, but not the outer court. He's told that um, this has been given to the nation so that the holy city will be tread underfoot 42 months. And then we have this interesting and very difficult portion having to do with two witnesses who prophesy. And John tells us about them and the imagery pertaining to them. They are killed, and um, verse 8 tells us, their dead bodies lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So there really shouldn't be any question about the enemy of the first section, the book of Revelation. It's where our Lord was crucified, which spiritually now is Sodom and Egypt, no longer really the people of God. It's where the temple is, and the Gentiles are going to be given this city to trample underfoot. So if you will, chapters 4 through 11 of Revelation parallel what we studied in our last hour. They parallel the Olivet Discourse up to verse 34, where Jesus is talking about the great tribulation that's about to come upon the Jews for their crucifying the Lord of glory. This is a historical judgment of God. It has now been accomplished in history. Then in chapter 12, we're told about warfare in heaven. We see that there's really something going on behind the scenes. The Lord's forces, Michael and his angels, are doing battle with Satan and his demons. It's Satan's desire to kill the child that is born to the woman introduced here. Here's the Messiah who comes from the woman, Israel. Okay? This is, Israel is the mother of the Messiah. And uh, Satan wants to destroy the child, but he cannot. And when he cannot destroy the child, at the end of chapter 12, we read that now the dragon, Satan, turns his energies another direction against the other children of the woman. That is to say, the, the new Israel of God uh, that has come into existence. He hasn't won the battle over Jesus in terms of his earthly ministry and so forth, but in history he wants to persecute the rest of the woman's child. So verse 17, the dragon waxed wroth with the woman and went away to make war with the rest of her seed to keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. And now we get introduced to the beast. And what we are told is that there's a beast that arises from across the Mediterranean Sea. Now, You've got to do your Bible homework. If you're standing in Palestine and you look across the Mediterranean Sea, which way are you looking? Toward Rome. Okay? And so there's a beast that arises from the sea, and the description of this beast makes very clear that the beast is the Roman Empire. Let's, uh, again, go to the 17th chapter, where John has an angelic interpretation brought to him. We would do well to listen to that as well. And this scarlet woman that is sitting upon the heads of the beast, verse 5 says, Upon her forehead a name is written, or a mysterious name is written, depending on the way you treat the Greek there, Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and the abominations of the earth. And she's drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So here you have a persecuting empire in the style of Babylon of old who is the harlot of all the abominations of the earth and the persecution is bringing martyrdom to God's people. In chapter 13 we had read that the beast that arises makes war with the saints for 42 months. Who is the beast? Obviously the beast is the Roman Empire. And the woman, the city, Babylon, that sits upon the seven hills, is the city of Rome. And as I've already indicated to you in the, in the discussion of the dating of the book, John is told that the seven heads of the beast are kings, they are emperors, 
And presently, the beast is incarnated in the person of Emperor Nero. We know that the beast's name is the number of a man. And in that day, recall that uh, letters of the alphabet were used for numerals as well. Accordingly, everybody's name has a numerical equivalent. And if you take the name of the beast and add up its numerical equivalent, you'll get 666. It so happens that the Jewish spelling of Nero's name, Neron Kaisron, adds up to 666. Here's an interesting aside. There's also a textual variant in the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that gives the number not as 666, but 616. Some people might say, oh, well, some scribe made a mistake, you know, looked at it wrong and wrote it wrong, and then that got picked up by others. The problem is, if, if, if you know the language, 666 and 616 don't look anything alike. It's not a visual mistake. I mean, it's highly unlikely. Well, that means some scribe purposely made a change. Why would he do that? Well, it turns out that another Hebrew spelling a Hebrew transliteration of the Latin name Nero Caesar adds up to 616. And so even though I don't approve of tampering with the text of Scripture, here's a case where the variant almost makes certain that our interpretation is correct. Because how else could you explain the alteration? Both in its Hebraized Latin form and the Hebraized Greek form, Nero's name is 666 or 616. So we have the Roman Empire as the beast. The beast has a head in any particular day. That head can be called the beast. Nero, in John's day, is the incarnation or expression of the beast. And so essentially, the book of Revelation tells us that God is going to bring judgment, first of all, upon those who have persecuted his son and the people of his son, Jerusalem, now spiritually called Sodom. And that great city, the holy city, will be tread under the feet of the Gentiles. Satan then turns his attention to persecute the rest of the woman's seed throughout the Roman Empire, the Church of Jesus Christ. And here you have the beast of Rome that becomes the persecuting force, and it will be destroyed by God as well. So the second judgment of God shows that the kingdom of Jesus Christ is going to stand against all opposition, Jewish or Roman. In the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, John then sees a picture of the victorious Lord riding upon a white horse. And he goes forth conquering and to conquer, but he conquers with the sword that proceeds from his mouth. That imagery, I mean, it's shameful to me the way interpreters miss the point. The word of God, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, the word of the Spirit of God proceeding from the mouth of Jesus Christ is what he uses now to conquer the nations. In the chap in chapter 20 of Revelation, we again look at the situation with Satan to understand how that is. And the explanation given is that Satan has been bound that he might deceive the nations no more. He has not been bound so he's inactive on planet Earth. It's not as though Satan's not doing anything. It's rather that he is restricted so that he cannot deceive the nations. Okay, let's put all this together that we've learned this afternoon. Jesus rose from the dead, victorious over Satan, is about now to spoil his house. He said, if I have conquered Satan, you know the strong man is bound. You go disciple the nations. Make them followers of me. John tells the church, don't worry about the opposition of Rome. Jesus is going to destroy Rome, even as he's going to destroy Jerusalem. And the preaching of the gospel from the mouth of the Son of God is going to conquer the nations because Satan has been bound that he'll deceive the nations no more. And then at the end, for a very short period, there is going to be an outbreak of apostasy and evil again. And upon that, Jesus will return in final judgment. And then we have the great white throne and the introduction of the new heavens and the new earth. So when people turn to the book of Revelation... Um, as giving pessimistic support to the idea that history is not going to really go anywhere. They have misinterpreted that book because it too, in its judgmental sections, the main body of the book, deals with the fall of Jerusalem, then the fall of Rome, and the victory of the gospel. 
And it's only at the very end of history when there's a falling away from this, a thousand years in comparison to a short period, as John says, that we have the final judgment when Jesus comes. The entire book, then, is not about the final coming of Christ, but only the end of the book. The judgmental portions have already been fulfilled in history, as God did have the Gentiles trample down Jerusalem, and he did destroy the beasts of the Roman Empire. Well, Dr. Bonson, we don't give up very easy, easily as pessimists. So maybe the Olivet Discourse doesn't really give us this pessimistic view, and maybe the book of Revelation doesn't give us that, but certainly we get that pessimistic view in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So let's turn to that one. 2 Thessalonians 2. Beginning the reading at the first verse, Now we beseech you, brethren, touching the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, to the end that ye be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet troubled, either by spirit or by word or by epistle, as though from us, as that the day of the Lord is just at hand. Let no man beguile you in any wise, for it will not be except the apostasy come first, and the man of sin be revealed. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know that which restrains to the end that he may be revealed in his own season. For the mystery of lawlessness does already work, only there is one that restrains presently until he be taken out of the way. And then shall be revealed the lawless one, whom the Lord Jesus shall slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the manifestation of his coming, even he whose coming is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceit of unrighteousness for them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God sends them a working of error, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be judged who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This passage is one of the most troubled passages in all of Scripture in terms of the way interpreters approach it. I don't say that to you so that I can, in, in advance, kind of start backing away from any problems you might have with the interpretation I'm going to offer. I'm hoping that you'll find my interpretation without flaw. <laughs> I'm not telling you that for this reason. I am telling you, however, that you cannot approach this passage and think that, well, everybody knows, and then you have this general interpretation that's obvious to everybody. If you really do know the literature, biblical studies, commentaries on 2 Thessalonians go a zillion, that's an overstatement, a zillion different ways on this detail or that and the overall thrust and so forth and so on. So you need to know that. About a part of this passage, Augustine, the church father, wrote, I confess that I am entirely ignorant of what he means to say. <laughs> That should give us all some humility if someone as great as Augustine said, look, I'm just ignorant. I don't, I don't get this. In the 1800s, 1887, a New Testament Greek scholar, M.R. Vincent, who wrote the book, still available, Word Studies in the New Testament, he said, I attempt no interpretation of this passage as a whole, which I do not understand. Here's a man who's gone into print. He's a great scholar of the New Testament. So he goes, I don't understand it. Leon Morris, in our own generation, wrote a commentary on this book, and he referred, excuse me, on this passage, and referred to it as a notoriously difficult passage. But I want to point out something to you. It is a tough passage. The interpretations go all these different ways. There are some weaknesses probably in my own approach to it. I realize that. But it was not a difficult passage for Paul's hearers. And that's where I want to begin our consideration of what it means. Look at verse 5. We've already considered it before. But Paul says, Remember you not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? There is a background to this passage of Scripture in Paul's oral instruction to the church at Thessalonica. And the text that we now have that has come down to us in history presupposes that oral background. 
And I dare say the key, which we do not have at least immediately before us, would be found if we had heard Paul's exposition. We've gone to Sunday school that week, sat in on what the pastor taught, then when he wrote back to the church, we'd read that and say, oh yeah, that's right, I remember you taught us that. You know what it was. But we weren't there. And so it's going to be much harder for us. But I don't want you to think it was difficult for the hearers who are the readers, the original readers of this text. That in itself should incline us toward the interpretation I'm going to offer you, I think. We need to look at the historical background of Paul's work in Thessalonica, and particularly his first epistle to the church at Thessalonica, and that will give us, I think, some insight into what's going on here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So for the next few moments, I would like to, um, to read and stop make some comments, I'd like to read for you just a brief um, bit on the historical setting of the book. Uh, this comes from one of my former students who has gone on to establish his own reputation as a theologian and uh, a writer in eschatology, and I'm very proud of him, though I'm going to differ with him in my interpretation here. I nevertheless uh, regard him very highly and have warm affection for him. That's Dr. Ken Gentry. Uh, Dr. Gentry writes, and I think it'll be helpful for us because it's so nicely compacted in its summary form here. The Thessalonian epistles are among Paul's earliest writings, uh, vying with Galatians and James as to the earliest written portions of the New Testament. The letters to Thessalonica were written from Corinth about A.D. 52, and within just a few weeks of each other, and not long after his visit, to Thessalonica. Turn back to 1 Thessalonians 2.17. But we, brethren, being bereaved of you for a short season, in present, not in heart, endeavored the more exceedingly to see your face with great desire. And so we know that Paul wrote this shortly after he had ministered among the Thessalonican Christians. According to Acts 17 and 18, Paul left Thessalonica to go to Berea and Athens for brief visits, and then on to Corinth, where he wrote the Thessalonian epistles. The place and circumstances of writing as discovered in Acts are helpful in casting some light on the dark and mysterious passage before us. During Paul's visit to Thessalonica, he preached to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. You'll find this in Acts 17, verses 1, 2, and 3. Though some Jews believed, others were riled to mob action regarding the Christian message, verses 4 and 5 of Acts 17. They even dragged some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, complaining, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus, verses 6 and 7. Let me stop and add a comment here. You're getting some very good hints already. If you know the background of Paul's ministry in Thessalonica, you know that when he was there, the Jews stirred up persecution and called upon the state to honor Caesar as Lord, therefore to persecute Christians who thought there was another king, one Jesus. After taking security from Jason and the others, the civil rulers let them go. Acts 17.9. This allowed Paul to depart safely to Berea. The Jews were not so easily quiet, however, for when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Acts 17.13. And this resulted in the immediate sending away of Paul to Athens, verses 14 and 15. All right, here's Paul. He goes as a missionary to Thessalonica. The Jews stir up trouble for him. They go in harmony with the state to get those who honor Caesar as king to give Christians a hard time. He leaves the city, and the Jews follow him to Berea to persecute him even further there, and he finally goes off to Athens. Paul stayed in Athens only three or four weeks, soon traveling to Corinth, Acts 18.1, where he remained for 18 months, according to verse 11. But again, serious Jewish antipathy arises. Interestingly, 
It was at Corinth where Paul met Aquila and Priscilla, Christians who had been among the Jews banished from Rome by Claudius Caesar, Acts 18.2. Please keep this, you, you, you've got to pick this up. Paul's persecuted by the Jews. They are going to the state, those who honor the Caesar, to get their help. He goes on to Berea, he finally goes on, ends up in Corinth. From Corinth, he writes back to the Christians at Thessalonica. And it's in Corinth that he met Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla were Jews who had to flee from Rome under the persecution of Claudius Caesar. According to Suetonius, who is a, a Roman historian, I quote, As the Jews were indulging in constant riots at the instigation of Crestus, Claudius banished them from Rome. Who is this Crestus? C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. Virtually every scholar will tell you it's a Latinization of the name of Christ. The Jews are instigating riots because of Crestus, because of Christ. And Claudius is just tired of this opposition, so he banishes them all. Aquila and Priscilla lead, they come to Corinth, and there they meet the Apostle Paul. Upon Meeting these saints who had suffered from Jewish riots against Christians in Rome, Paul set about preaching to the Jews in Corinth as he had at Thessalonica that Jesus is the Christ. Again the Jews violently resisted him, organizing resistance against him and blaspheming to such an extent that at that point, Acts 18.6, he determined to turn from the Jews to the Gentiles. So this is a break point in Paul's ministry. The Jews had persecuted him and persecuted him. We're having trouble with the Roman authorities. And there at Corinth, he finally says, that's it, I turn to the Gentiles. Matters were made worse for him by his remarkable success with a certain prominent Jewish leader, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, Acts 18.8. Though Paul seldom baptized, he did baptize Crispus. References is made in 1 Corinthians 1 to that. Due to the intensity of the opposition, the Lord provided Paul with special promise of safety for him to remain in Corinth, according to Acts 18, verses 9 to 11. Now, Dr. Gentry says, all of this explains the strong language against the Jews in the Thessalonian epistles and helps uncover some of the more subtle concerns therein as well. For instance, in his first epistle, Paul wrote, and here I'm quoting 1 Timothy 2, 14 to 16. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Okay? First epistle tells you already, Paul says God's wrath is coming on these Jews to the uttermost for this persecution and for the fact also that they have cooperated with the Roman Empire. He goes on, Dr. Gentry goes on, Paul complained of a Satan-inspired thwarting of his ministry. And now I'm going to differ with Dr. Gentry, but he says, which according to the context probably indicates Jewish opposition. I would differ there. I think when Paul says, we would come back to you, but Satan hindered us, he's referring not to the Jews, though they instigated the hindering, he's referring to the civil government that is opposing him returning. Remember the government hauled Jason and the others before them, and they were appalled that they were declaring there's another king, Jesus, and so forth? Paul is referring to them, I believe, as Satan. And as support of this, let's just look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. The one that Paul calls the man of lawlessness, in verse 9, about him, Paul says, even he who's coming is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Paul sees the man of lawlessness is inspired by Satan. Turn to Revelation 13, verse 4. Revelation 13 is a discussion of the beast. I hope you remember what I've been 
saying just a few moments ago. This is the discussion of the Roman Empire and the emperors of Rome. Verse 4 says, And they worshipped the dragon, that is the devil, because he gave his authority unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to war against him? And so I think biblical indication is that when Paul says Satan resisted us, he's referring here to that civil authority under the higher command of Rome that was in opposition to the church. So in 1 Thessalonians, Paul has indicated that the wrath of God is coming upon the Jews to the uttermost and that Satan is resisting the advance of the gospel. And as you know, I take Satan here to be the satanically inspired political persecution of God's people. Dr. Gentry says that Paul probably alludes to Jewish opposition in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 4 and following, where he mentions their perseverance and afflictions for their faith. So let's look at that. 2 Thessalonians now, chapter 1, at the fourth verse. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your endurance and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions which you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God to the end that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. If so be that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense affliction to them that afflict you and to you that are afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with the angels of his power in flaming fire, rendering vengeance to them that know not God, and to them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This also may be motivating his request that the Thessalonians pray for his deliverance from such, well, chapter 3, verse 2, from such unreasonable and wicked men. The Jewish context is important for grasping the situation Paul confronts. Okay, the end of reading of Dr. Gentry's historical background. With that in mind, the ministry of Paul, as Acts tells us, and what he says in the first epistle, I do believe we can turn to 2 Thessalonians for all of the torment of the commentators and make a great deal of sense out of it. Before I give you my particular interpretation, however, I'm going to kind of run to the end of the debate and win the major point that has to be won, and then I'm going to go back and fill in some details. Here's the major point that has to be established. Whatever Paul was talking about in terms of the man of lawlessness, he was talking about the first generation of the church. He was not talking about the end of human history. He was not talking about somebody that's going to be revealed down the line. And so how can you prove that, Dr. Bonson? Well, three indications that settle the time question, I think, decisively. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, makes reference of the man of lawlessness as he that opposes and exalts himself against all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. When Paul wrote this, he was referring to the temple in Jerusalem is still standing and is someone committing a desecrating act in that temple. Therefore, the fulfillment of this prophecy has to do to some event prior to A.D. 70. Secondly, you notice in verse 6 that there is a present restraining of this man of lawlessness. And now you know that which restrains to the end that he may be revealed in his own season. Paul says, right now the man of lawlessness would be openly declared if it weren't for a certain restraint. You know that which restrains. Well, again, whatever you make of the text then, the man of lawlessness has to be a man in Paul's day that is presently being restrained. And then thirdly, The man of lawlessness is already at work in mystery form, he says in verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness does already work. Only there is one that restrains now until he be taken out of the way. Okay, I'm going to give you my interpretation. But if you don't like my interpretation, I'm going to differ with my 
one of my best students, Ken Gentry, here as well. Uh, if you don't like, you know, mine, just like I have some improvement to make of his, everybody's interpretation has to be within this framework. The prophecy is fulfilled while the temple of Jerusalem is standing, and it takes place in the lifetime of Paul and or his readers. Because the man of lawlessness is already there, and he's already at work in mystery form, but there's something presently restraining him. And thus, this is what we call a preterist interpretation. Whatever the prophecy is about, assume I'm wrong for the time being in my details, whatever it's about, it's about something in the past not about the second coming of Jesus Christ in the future. And so, let's go back and I'll give you now what I think Paul is telling us. Verses 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, touching the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, to the end that you be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet troubled either by spirit or by word or epistle, as though from us that the day of the Lord is just at hand. When Paul here speaks of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Dr. Gentry thinks that he's referring to the coming and judgment on Jerusalem in AD 70. And I believe that's mistaken. And I realize that might be a real obvious thing to run to, and there's enough indications that would lead people that way that I don't think Dr. Gentry's made just some kind of horrendous error. But I think in the end that that's not correct. When Paul speaks of the coming of Jesus Christ in verse 1, he's talking about the final coming of Jesus at the end of history. And I think that that is provable because just three verses before this, in what we call a different chapter, chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, he's talking about how the Lord will come with the glory of his might. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all them that believe, because our testimony unto you was believed in that day. So Paul has spoken of the day of the Lord in that day when Jesus comes, when he arrives. And in chapter 1, everybody knows he's referring to the second coming. Then in just three verses, he says, Now I beseech you, brothers, touching the coming of our Lord, I mean, it just stands for reason, doesn't it, that he's talking about the coming that he's just mentioned. So about that coming, he wants to say more. The particular Greek word that is used for coming, by the way, is the word uh, parousia, which um, means actually presence. It comes to have the sense of arrival or coming in the Greek. In fact, if you do background study on this, it's interesting. Often important personages, royal parties, were said to have a parousia. They would arrive, and that was the, the presence or the coming of, well, Paul's using similar language. Now it's the king of kings and the lord of lords, the greatest royal party that's going to have its arrival. It's parousia. This word parousia is found, it turns out, in the first epistle that he writes to the Thessalonians. So if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, well, this is not where the word appears, but Paul in the first epistle is talking about the return of Christ at the end of history, where we read, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. As we wait for Jesus from heaven, then chapter 2, verse 19 says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of glorying? Are not even ye before our Lord Jesus at his parousia, at his coming? Chapter 3, verse 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the parousia, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Notice, with all his saints. Chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we that are alive, that are left unto the coming of the Lord, shall in no wise precede them that are fallen asleep. And then finally, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved entire without blame at the coming, the parousia, of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So, we know that Paul spoke of the second coming of Christ and pervasively in the first epistle called it the arrival, the parousia of Christ. It is the final day, as 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17 makes clear. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so the parousia, the arrival that Paul has already instructed the Thessalonians about in his first epistle, is the second coming of Christ at the day of resurrection when we will meet the saints in the air and be brought to the Lord Jesus together with them. So now if you look at 2 Thessalonians 2, I think you can see why I have to disagree with Dr. Gentry. Now we beseech you, brethren, touching the parousia of our Lord Jesus, three verses later, that's a reference to the second coming of Christ, the parousia of our Lord Jesus, and our gathering together unto him. Well, 1 Thessalonians had emphasized we're going to be gathered together to all the other saints and then into the very presence of Christ himself. So, my first point is, Paul is making reference to what he's already been teaching them about the final coming of Jesus Christ. But, there's a problem. Verse 2 says, the reason I want to talk to you further about this is for this end, that you not be quickly shaken from your mind, nor troubled either by spirit of a word or by epistle as though from us, as though the day of the Lord is just at hand. He says, I don't want you to think the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be taking place real soon. And somebody apparently has forged Paul's name and has written a letter, and other people are using Paul's reputation to teach something which is contrary to the truth about eschatology. Paul says, I've taught you about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and about how we'll be gathered together with the other saints unto the Lord in that day. But you are wrong to think that that's going to happen real soon. Now that in itself is helpful, isn't it? Because you've been taught, haven't you? Over and over again, things you've read or people you've heard, dispensationalists have said, that can happen any time. Paul says, no, it can't. I don't want you to be shaken in mind to think that. And here's why. Let no man beguile you in any wise, for this will not be except the falling away or apostasy come first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, etc. So, Paul says, I've taught you about the second coming and our gathering together unto the Lord, but somebody is trying to tell you that that has already taken place or is about to take place, and I don't want you to believe that. In fact, he says, if you remember what I taught you before, you know that first of all, you'd have to have the falling away, the apostasy, and the revelation of the man of sin, and then all the other things that, that Paul goes on to talk about. It's evident from the Thessalonian epistles uh, that whatever the nature of the eschatological error is, it led people to give up working. And they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't keep doing their daily chores and so forth. And they expected Jesus was going to, you know, rapture them, and they didn't have to continue. And they were not taking care of their own needs, but mooching off of others. Do you say mooching? They were parasites on others. Okay. Okay. And Paul will later say they are to be disciplined, those who will not work, so forth, but are taking advantage of other people. So I'll leave it to you to figure out what, what kind of thinking they had where they thought, well, Jesus is either about to come or has already come, and it's just a few days, and he's going to gather us together, so I quit my job, and by the way, won't you feed me, please? Okay. So that's the nature of the problem. And Paul is now showing that that's a mistake because they should realize that first you have to have the man of sin revealed. And there has to be this falling away or apostasy. He's not talking about something in the future. He's not talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ then when he deals with the man of sin. He's talking about something in his own day. And he says, look, this hasn't happened yet, so you can't begin to think Jesus is going to return. Now what is it that hasn't taken place? Verse 3. Let no man beguile you in any wise, for it will not be except the 
falling away, the apostasy come first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I want to emphasize a couple things real importantly here. Falling away here, the Greek word uh, that's transliterated apostasy, is used in Greek for both religious decline, turning against your former considerations, apostasizing from the truth, but it's also used of political insurrection and rebellion. In fact, we have far more references in ancient uh, literature available to us of the word being used for political apostasy, political rebellion, than for religious. And so let's just see if we can work out an interpretation, understanding it that way. I'm going to use the word rebellion, because in English I think that comes closer to this idea of a apostasy from constituted civil authority. For this day will not take place except the rebellion come first. And what will the rebellion trigger? The rebellion comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So Paul has instructed them that there's going to be a political rebellion. And that is going to bring about the open manifestation of somebody called the man of lawlessness. Now this man of lawlessness is already at work, but in a hidden form. In verse 3, the man of sin will be revealed, the Greek word, you know, the unveiling. He'll be openly exposed, if you will, to be a man of lawlessness. But verse 7 says, the mystery of lawlessness does already work. Only there is one that restrains now until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8, and then shall be revealed the lawless one. So what you have is this lawless, whatever it is, going on. Something lawless is going on. Right now it's working in veiled form, hidden form, the mystery form of that lawlessness. But after the rebellion, then it's going to be opened wide up. No longer a mystery, but an apocalypsis of it. And what is it that's going on right now that will not come into the open until the rebellion? Well, it's a man of lawlessness. Who is the man of lawlessness? I know this is what you've been waiting to hear, finally. In Revelation, the 13th chapter, we have the beast described for us. And, of course, the thing that you remember most, if you listen to the popular eschatological literature and programs of our day, is that the beast has his name written on the forehead and upon the hand of men. This is an allusion to the Old Testament the book of Deuteronomy, where God told his people, write my law upon your forehead, upon your hand. The beast doesn't follow the law of God. He replaces his own authority for God's. And thus, where John uses the imagery of the forehead and hand, Paul explains it as, he's a man who's a lawless person. He revolts against the authority of God, and he operates it will turn out to persecute God's people. He's a lawless one. But right now, that's in mystery form. That's hidden. Because up until the days when <clears throat> Paul was talking about, the Roman Empire seemed to be a lawful authority. It brought the Pax Romana. It brought peace. <clears throat> Pardon me. So much so that the Apostle Paul could actually use the Roman government and its laws and forms to protect himself as an apostle. But he says those days are going to end. This is really a lawless government, but right now it's in hidden form. Right now it appears that we can make use of the Roman Empire to protect us. <clears throat> but not for long. He's writing from Corinth. Who did he meet in Corinth? Aquila and Priscilla, who had now been expelled from Rome because the Roman emperor is sick and tired of the Jews and the Christians fighting each other. Things are beginning to heat up, and this opposition of the Roman Empire to the Christian faith, which is now operating already, but in kind of veiled form, is going to, after the rebellion, be blurted wide open for everybody to see. What is the rebellion then? The rebellion is the Jews resisting Rome and having Titus come in and destroy Jerusalem. 
when the Jews rebel against Rome and they are destroyed, now the open lawlessness of the Roman Empire and its set of emperors is going to be evident. Why? Because up to this point there had been a restraint. And what is that restraint? Now, this is not a popular view, but it has very good heritage in that B.B. Warfield, one of the best Reformed scholars of this century, wrote it up, and I think he's exactly right. Warfield says that which was restraining in the days before the open manifestation of the lawlessness of Rome was the existence of the Jews. As long as Jerusalem stood and the Jews were constituted as a religious body, we know this for fact. The Romans at first thought the Christians were only a sect of the Jews. And there was a policy in the Roman Empire that a religion was a licit religion if it already existed at the time that Rome occupied that new country or territory. And provided you did not foment rebellion against Rome, you could keep your religion. Well, then when Christianity shows up, and the Romans interpret this as just one more Jewish sect who cares about their infighting, then there was a period of time when the Christians had protection. And so, ironically, though the Jews hated the Christians, as long as they had not rebelled against Rome and been put down, they formed a buffer. They were a restraint on the man of lawlessness. And so the Roman Empire, already a lawless force, its mystery form is at work, is restrained from persecuting the, the church of God as long as the Jews are still there as a buffer, a restrainer. But what will happen when the restraint is taken out of the way? Well, the restraint was taken out of the way when Rome had to finally go to war with the Jews in A.D. 70. And now the Jews are destroyed, but guess what? The Christians continue, and it really turns out that they were not a sect of the Jews. We've already seen some hints of that in that Claudius expels these Jews and Christians who are fighting with each other. And so that which was minimally seen is now going to be open to everybody, and now the man of lawlessness will vent his wrath against the church directly. No more a restrained form, no more a mystery form of it, but he will be openly revealed to be a man of lawlessness. Who is the man of lawlessness? I don't believe it's one single individual. The man of lawlessness is a title for the emperor of Rome, whoever happens to occupy the seat at this point. Because the emperors of Rome direct the empire in its persecuting force. Therefore, when Dr. Gentry says the man of lawlessness is Nero, I have to differ. Because Nero was destroyed a year and a half before Jerusalem fell. The fall of Jerusalem, the rebellion of the Jews, you see, is what brings the open form of the man of lawlessness. So by the time that uh, we have the open revelation of this man of lawlessness, it's not Nero, but it's Vespasian and, and further emperors. But what Paul is saying is you have then these emperors of Rome, the man of lawlessness. You say, well, that's a single form. That's not really a problem. In America, we speak of the man who is the president, you know. Well, the man changes from regime to regime, but it's still the highest authority. The, so the man of lawlessness, if you will, is the office of emperor. And now let's read Again, what it says, and I'll add one more thing, and we'll have the passage tied together. <clears throat> Let no man beguile you, verse 3, in any wise, for the coming of Christ, the final coming, will not take place except the rebellion of the Jews against Rome comes first, and then the man of sin will be openly revealed, the son of perdition, he who opposes and exalts himself against all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. The Roman emperors were all deified, setting themselves forth as God. When Titus finally invaded Jerusalem, the Roman ensigns were set up in the Holy of Holies, sitting in the temple of God as though the Roman emperor is God. Paul says, don't you remember when I was with you, I told you? And now you know that which restrains. You know these Jews who have been persecuting me, they are the ones that have been restraining this 
to the end that the man of lawlessness will be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but there is one that restrains until he is taken out of the way. And then shall be openly revealed this lawless one. And Paul says, the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the manifestation of his coming. The one whose coming is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Revelation 13 says that the beast comes to power according to Satan's authorization. And when he comes to power, he will work lying wonders. And we don't have time to get into it. I'm already over time. But the uh, book of Revelation confirms exactly what Paul says here. The, the emperor was worshipped as God. He came with lying wonders. And he was satanically inspired. How will he be destroyed? The Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring, to nothing, and bring him to nothing by the manifestation of his coming. What will be the breath of Jesus' mouth that destroys the Roman Empire? Remember what I said about Revelation 19? Jesus rides upon a white horse and destroys all opposition with what? A sword that proceeds from his mouth. I think Paul is saying here, the Jews... Though they've been persecuting us, they're going to rebel against Rome, and they're going to get what they have coming to them. But then the restraint will be taken out of the way, and the Roman Empire is going to unleash its fury against us. But in return, Jesus, through the preaching of the gospel, will destroy the Roman Empire. That's exactly what happened in history. The church prevailed, Rome fell. And that's my interpretation of 2 Thessalonians. If you don't think that's correct... The one thing I have to remind you is, whatever Paul's talking about, it was, he was talking about something in his own day, not the very end of history. And now I've gone over time, so I have to be very quick on the last passage that I want to talk to you about. It's somewhat different than the three that we've considered thus far. We've looked at the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24. We've looked at the book of Revelation, chapters 4 through 19, We've now looked at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about the man of lawlessness. Somebody might say, Dr. Bonson, what do you do with the text like 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, and then verse 13 of the same chapter? 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, the first four verses, and then verse 13. But know this that in last days, in the last days, grievous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, haughty, railers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, implacable, slanderers, without self-control, fierce, not lovers of good, traitors, headstrong, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, but having denied the power the, thereof. From these also turn away. And then Paul says more about these, and in verse 13 he says, But evil men and impostors shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived.